Okay, now let's talk about thermal shock resistance. Um, first off, I have no thermal shock resistance. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I get out of the bed on a cold day and I just want to jump right back in. Woo! That change in temperature did not like it one bit. But eventually, after I get kind of used to it, I'm okay with it. Now, thermal shock in, in materials is due to non-uniform heating and cooling. Okay? Non-uniform heating and cooling. Um, typically, this comes with the cooling aspect. If you take something that is very, very cold and pour it into something that's very, very hot, it will cause it to shatter. Um, you might have seen this with glass. If you've ever seen like a very, very hot glass and you suddenly drop it into a bucket of ice water, you know, all the ice in the water, well, it's going to cause it to shatter or at least to crack because suddenly part of this will begin to contract very, very quickly while the rest of it does not. This is still hot, this is still cold, and that difference is going to induce stresses, which will lead to failure. Okay? So, it will lead to failure. So, the big thing you have to be careful about is how fast are you going to cool something. Metals, you can cool faster than glasses. I wouldn't want to cool a glass very quickly, because if I do, I might crack it. Plastics are pretty strong they don't really matter too much however you can still crack a uh, plastic uh, my wife and i love to make smoothies we had a blender it was a wonderful ninja blender never buy one though because they fall apart pretty quickly but for a while it was great um, but however one day we had just made a smoothie and we decided we need to clean it and we cleaned it too quickly we just started pouring some very hot water into a very very cold plastic and it didn't cause it to fail but all these microscopic cracks eventually went in the surface and because of those cracks eventually it began to leak and that was no fun for any of us so we want to find a way of saying okay how do we you know know how fast we can quench something which has a very good thermal shock resistance well we know that the temperature difference is going to be produced by one um, the quench rate how fast i do it and the thermal conductivity when I say temperature difference, it's not between the like water that's heating it up and the glass itself. I'm saying between one section of the glass and another section of the glass, or one section of the metal and another section of the metal. So if it's got very high thermal conductivity, then it's all going to cool down or heat up at the same time. There'll be no temperature difference. Very low thermal conductivity, then one side's going to be much hotter than the rest. Um, I'll give the example of a log that's on fire. You can have an end of your stick be on fire, but it doesn't have a very good thermal conductivity, so the other end of the stick is not all that hot. The second thing is we have to remember that that temperature difference will lead to a strain, and that strain will cause a stress, an internal stress. And if that stress reaches the fracture stress, it will fail. So there's a temperature right here where it will cause it to fail because of the stresses in there. So if we set those equal, then we can figure out, okay, what rate can I cool it at? What's my quench rate for fracture, which is equal to my thermal shock resistance, and that is proportional to the failure stress. So if that's very, very high, then it's going to be less likely to fail, even with a sizable temperature difference. Multiply by the thermal conductivity, because the better it is at conducting heat, the less likely it is to fail, because the more difficult will be to have a temperature difference. Over the modulus elasticity, this gets bigger and bigger as you get stiffer and stiffer. So something that's very elastic and likes to stretch won't have as much of an issue because it's all going to be willing to stretch anyway over the th coefficient of the thermal expansion. So the smaller my coefficient of thermal expansion, the less things are going to be pressing on each other. Okay less it's going to be pressing on each other. There'll be less contraction here and less, um, sorry, there'll be less expansion here and less contraction right here, which means that there's not very much of a difference, there's not much strain, and therefore it won't fail. So all these things are playing together to give us thermal shock resistance. Okay? All those things are playing in there. So if you want to be very thermally resistant, you need to be very elastic, have a low coefficient thermal expansion, 
a high failure stress and a high thermal conductivity, and then you'll be golden. So the reason we care about this is mostly for thermal protection systems, like the Space Shuttle Orbiter. We haven't been using it for many years now, um, but it was awesome. And it had all these different types of materials on it in different places because they had different thermal shock resistance. Suddenly, when it's going into the atmosphere, there is massive amounts of um, energy being poured onto this. The friction is just insane. The friction actually causes the air in front of it to turn into plasma. And so these things need to have a very good thermal shock resistance. They need to have a very good thermal or very poor thermal conductivity. We do not want the astronauts on the inside to be getting hot. And they need to be, you know, have a very low coefficient of thermal expansion because we don't want them to expand while they're on there, at least most of them not to expand. Because they start expanding, they might lead to gaps or they might break each other. And so we use these silica tiles because one, silica doesn't have a very good coefficient of thermal expansion, not very good conductors of heat. They're not as quite as good as plastics, but plastics are just too low density to use. And then because of their microstructure, they became actually even better than they would be normally um, because all these silicon fibers were bonded to each other during heat treatment. So we can use heat treatment to change its properties. In this case, we added all these gaps, which made it a very, very poor conductor of heat. So all the things we've been learning about have been leading up to how we protect things and how we keep our materials from failing so they can meet their goals and keep the people who are using them safe. So that's it for this time. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this helps you, and I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.